My parents were black nationalists and it was always instilled in me that I have to serve black people, that there's no way that I could be the person that I was, living the life that I lived, I'm not in shackles and chains if I didn't serve black people. And my parents also really instilled in me that only black people can free black people, that it's not gonna be anybody else coming to save us. And so that's always been a strong kind of foundation of who I was. And I knew that was gonna be like my purpose, in serving black people. And um, the way that I originally thought I was gonna do that was through healthcare and like being a clinician, right? That I was literally gonna save black people's lives individually. Um, and after undergrad, um, I started working in Planned Parenthood and my own experiences in the reproductive um, health field and um, reproductive justice, it was something that I was really passionate about. And so I was at Planned Parenthood um, doing my um, classes for med school and um, I uh, tested my first person um, who was HIV positive. And that experience for me really kind of shaped my trajectory. Um, the um, the person that I um, tested, he was a young black gay man, and he had this inevitability, inevitability that he was going to be diagnosed with HIV. Um, and to kind of live in that type of way, I thought was just so unfair. Um, and in school, I studied public health, and um, one of the big kind of areas we studied was HIV. And I was always really amazed by the amazing kind of um, uh, advocacy that happened in HIV that really shaped public health overall. The advocacy from people who are living with HIV, people who are affected by HIV, changed public health for everybody. So the way we get medications approved has changed drastically because of advocates that said to the FDA, you have to make sure that, you know, when people are dying from, you know, these diseases, that people have medications to uh, be able to utilize them. There's no other disease state like HIV that has the amount of money because of the activism for things like Ryan White. Um, and that even when it comes to like the strategies to respond to HIV, advocates and activists have really been at the center of how we do these kind of interventions. And so for me, HIV was an opportunity to think about how, from the successes we've had in responding to HIV, that we could respond to so many other health um, diseases and health states that affect black communities, and there's so many lessons to be learned. And so um, it became kind of a natural trajectory for me. Um, uh, after Planned Parenthood, I saw the job posting at Black AIDS Institute, and I said, where has this organization been all my life? Because I'm blackity black, and I love health. <laughs> Right, and so being able to combine these things um, for me was really exciting, and I think that um, the field of HIV has so much to teach other folks. We obviously are not at the end of the epidemic, but the successes that we've had, um, I think, can, conform, can inform so much. I would say my life brought me into this field of work, um, and when I say this field of work, I'm thinking like more of the public health stuff. Um, I've been doing public health work for over 15 years now, and. It took for me to find out when I was HIV positive for me for me to realize how unaccessible, if that's a word, how how it was hard to access a lot of the resources and services that were supposed to be for us. And I think it took for me to really have to navigate through the systems myself to understand the complications. And then when I started understanding the complications, that's when I started saying, wait, I can't let my other brothers and sisters fall short because of what people are not really advertising or promoting for us to get access to. So I think um, that's what initially brought me into the field. And me also recognizing that my story is not the only one that's similar to others. I, um, that's what made me write my book, Metamorphosis of a Heart, because I started then realizing that, you know, people aren't sharing their stories or sharing their experiences so other people can know that there's either a way out or that there is light at the end of the tunnel. So that's where I felt like I came in. And so with me now having this responsibility and this role and position in this particular work of public health, I started realizing that this is my chance to really help bridge my communities to the resources that they did not even know was available for them. And what keeps me in the work is the fact that I still have hope that some lives are being changed. And I also realize that, you know, the impact is much more than what a report or a contract might entail. The fact that I get to hear testimonials of people saying, wow, this really helped me or this really changed my life, to me, that's the reward in itself. So that's what keeps me there. Knowing that um, a lot of people don't have people that care enough genuinely to just 
authentically help without needing something in return. And that's what I feel honored to be able to be for, that pe for other people in this world. More than 20 years ago, um, I was a young Master of Social Work student. Um, and um, ever since I uh, pursued my education at Washington University, I came out hungry to be of service to community, hungry to be of service to the people who especially look and love the way that I do. Um, I've had a long history of working for a, a wide range of community-based organizations, um, many of them black on purpose, many of them LGBT on purpose, um, and finding the opportunity to merge ethnic identity and sexual um, orientation was important to me because I see myself as a black gay man. That's the nexus of my identity. And so um, the work that I do is really informed by the lens for which I see the world. Um, and um, it's easy. It comes natural to just really do the work that, um, that I really find to be um, at the heart of who we are as people. So I can't see myself um, in any other field um, but the health and human social service field. Um, it's what I do, it's, 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 um, it feels good to be of a helping hand to other people. It feels good to help people uh, who may need a hand up, um, and it feels good to reach out to people who may be able to help me uh, take another step in life. Um, community is so important. I think that that's in large part uh, what I think many of us have lost in terms of how we interact with community. That sense of communalism um, unfortunately has dwindled a little bit away and um, I hope that the work that we do at Ahmad um, really steps further into helping us to really kind of build community more, um, celebrate community more and, and talk about the, the oneness of who we are. Um, even when we're going through our dysfunctions, even uh, when we're dealing with trauma that has been unresolved, we still have an ability to be a part of the tribe. Um, and um, our tribe is important, and let's celebrate the tribe, and let's continue to pull people back into the tribe, even when they've strayed away. I think I've always been an outsider, and um, it's hard for some people to believe because I've been such an insider in my work and career, but never really uh, felt included or, or part of the communities I was a part of as a, as a young person. And I never wanted other people to feel that way too. Um, I'm the person who would be in a group of five or six people having a conversation at a dinner party or just at a cocktail party and notice that there's somebody on the outside who is not part of that group who's standing by himself or herself and feel bad for that person and want that person to be included because I remember being that person and have often been that person. And so I think growing up in a white community in, in uh, St. Louis, Missouri, when I was younger, um, going to a white school in, in, uh, for high school and college and law school, um, being a black gay man, um, being just myself in a world that doesn't really encourage or enable us to do that sometimes has taught me what it means to be an outsider. It's taught me what it means to be excluded and has reminded me that I don't want other people to feel that way. I didn't like feeling that way. I still don't like feeling that way. If there's anything that we can do as, as humans to make life better for ourselves and one, one another is simply to make sure that people feel included. Why is that so hard? I started volunteering at my first um, community health center back in high school, um, back at home in 7 by 7 in Virginia. Um, that work continued around 2008, 2009 when I dropped out of college, went to FIT, moved to New York, moved to FIT. Um, and I started working as a peer educator at Faces New York, working ahead for community empowerment support. Um, so long as running. Uh, minority-led HBNA service organization in Harlem. Um, from there, I was a peer educator, um, 
community health specialist, program development specialist, um, and then after doing a number of sort of creation of community level interventions, like The Wiz, which I co-created with Jack Swahi, um, and a number of other, started master training for 3 me, all that sort of stuff, I found myself, one of the places burnt out, because all of the contracts that we worked on then um, were specifically targeted at the house and bar I'm seeing. And so to be like a house parent who works in the field and constantly has to loop, not only lose family members, but also tell folks their status, make sure they're staying connected to care, make sure they're getting into housing, I was absolutely burned out. Um, and I was at a place where um, I wanted to focus on something that I had lived experience with and a lot of my lived experience from childhood all the way to recent years was in homelessness and housing instability um, and so the opportunity presented itself for me to move on at the time to True Colors Fund um, as a program manager and I've been there for the five years since. Um, while I was still at FACES I met Sarah Jordy now or you know she's Swedish my sister um, who directed Kiki um, and I think even throughout the creation of that process we had like a number of like really high profile pieces that came out about about the project that I was featured on um, HBO's The Outlist and and then there was just a bunch of stuff that just started happening <laughs> um, it hasn't really stopped since um, so Kiki came out and had its premiere at Sundance in 2016 um, won a number of awards that year um, went to over 70 festivals around the world. Um, we won the Teddy at Berlin Alley, we won the Emerging Talent Award at Outfest. Um, so all these sorts of opportunities started to present themselves. Um, some in programming for festivals, some in curating for events, some in producing. Um, and so now my life is all of the things.